Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, uh, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we are called a webinar, a webcast, an online show. Um, the, the, word, the, I don't know, the terminology is up for debate. <laughs> um, but whatever we are, we're here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record all of our shows, so you can always go to our website um, whenever you like and see the recordings of all of our shows going back to uh, January 2009 when we first started Encompass Live. So we're in, what that make us our seventh year? That's a long time. Eight. Whoa, really? That can't be right. Nine, yeah, we're ten, just 11, starting 12. our eighth year. Gosh, oh wow. Okay, that's longer than I thought. <laughs> and we're still going strong. Wow. <laughs> um, we do a mixture of things here on the show. Uh, presentations, interviews, mini training sessions, training sessions, um, book review sessions. Um, basically anything library related, we're happy to have on the show, which is probably a reason of our longevity. If you do something in the library, we'll, we'll share about, about it. Um, and we bring in guest speakers sometimes, but we also sometimes have um, library commission staff. Um, and that's what we have this morning. Um, with me today is Deborah Dracos and Susan Nisley, are both from the library commission. And our topic today is riding the range from your armchair. Um, which, just looking at the title, you might not know what that means, but <laughs> <laughs> it's book reviews, book discussion yeah. about Westerns. So, the yes, Western we're, genre. we're continuing a theme started by mm -hmm. our continuing education coordinator, yeah. Laura Johnson, who's now retired. Yes, she retired oh. last month. She, she's <laughs> left us. She let, retired last month. <laughs> uh, but she thought it was very important to talk about books every once in a while. And sometimes we've talked about specific genres, sometimes we've just talked about um, you know, hot reads, what's mm -hmm. going on right now. But this particular time, we chose to talk about Westerns. And I actually read the Westerns, which are not my usual genre. And Susan did um, research on what constitutes a Western and some of the um, resources that you can use to find some new ones. So... Okay. Need to, hang on. Might need to. Right, there, there we go. There, nice Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so normally, um, when you're talking with a patron um, about what they are looking for as far as reading goes, when you're doing your reader's advisory interview, um, you ask about things like, well, what did you like in the book? Was it the setting? Was it the time? period, what was the, you know, the, were there certain appeals? Um, and sometimes people, when they think Westerns, think, well, Westerns are all the same. But actually, mm -hmm. that's not true. <laughs> it's like any other genre. Mm -hmm. There are different subcategories, mm -hmm. basically. So for the setting, did you want to talk about? Um, well, it's interesting. As you read information about the genre, um, you see some, uh, some sort of what's what's the standard understanding, but then uh, it, it always expands from there. So um, oftentimes articles will reference Westerns as being um, from after the Civil War until um, early 20th century. Um, you have people who think that uh, the frontier closed in 1890, so that's a cutoff that some people use. Um, you also see people talking a lot about how uh, the uh, Western really started out, the roots of the Western were James Fenimore Cooper and his leather stocking tales, and those, of course, start in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, and the frontier back then was anything west of <laughs> west of New York, <laughs> west of New York <laughs> yeah. um, you know anything mm -hmm. west of the um, Appalachians um, so you know you have Ohio Kentucky back then that was the frontier mm. um, so it really depends on what your patron is interested in do they really want what's their definition of the West and is that the most important part of the book for them do they are they more interested in people um, going out into uncharted territory, or do they really want something set in Wyoming or Texas? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you're looking for books for the patron, that makes a difference. You mm -hmm. can often look uh, for books set in particular states. Um, 
if if they're not particular, um, you can have westerns that are set in Western uh, Canada. You can have yeah. westerns that are set in Alaska, uh, Alaska, um, mm -hmm. that that cross over into Mexico, mm -hmm. um, Arizona. Um, definitely, uh, definitely, you know, west can be anything probably west of the uh, eastern seaboard. Um, mm -hmm. So again, you know, what. What is it about the setting? What 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 is their definition of a Western setting that appeals to them? So that's mm -hmm. that's um, you know that's open to interpretation. Right. Right. Um, and as far as the time goes, Susan mentioned you know the sort of after the Civil War, but you know maybe cut off in the 1890s. Um, the Western Writers of America website, when they're handing out awards, actually um, defines uh, their traditional or historical Westerns as anything that where the story takes place pre-1940. And then anything wow. after 1940 is a contemporary Western story. Hmm. So they do acknowledge the contemporary time period, too. But, uh -huh. And there's actually another organization that uh, is called Western Fictioneers. Uh, they're a professional writing group. They didn't uh, establish themselves until 2010, but they offer something called a Peacemaker Award. And they're very specific about their time period. They will only, uh, uh, the only type, titles that are eligible for awards are those that are 50%, at least 50% of the story has to be set between 1830 and 1920, so that's their definition. Mm -hmm. And they do uh, promote themselves as uh, as uh, wanting to focus attention on what they call the, tr the traditional Western, and so they're, mm -hmm. they've got a very um, narrowly defined time period. Mm -hmm. So the appeal of a Western, <laughs> um, I think, this is basically, There's, why do people mm -hmm. like Westerns? What yeah. is it about the Western that they like? And uh, lots of times it's the the good always, the white hats always win, right? You go to a Western movie and the white hats always win. The good guy wins. There's some kind of justice usually at the end. Um, often the hero is somewhat of a loner, can be somewhat of a loner. Um, they're struggling against something. An, another person or against the uh, the nature, whatever's going on, you know, sort of survivalist type mm -hmm. thing. Um, and, and sometimes, well, in a, a large number of them that I read, too, uh, it's they're trying to bring in some kind of uh, civilizing influence, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, they still want to be independent, you know, the independent, rugged, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah person who can make it on their own if they need to. Well, again, it, it really uh, runs the gamut. I think with the traditional Western, you get lots of, um, you know, when, when, when people are writing about the genre, they talk about um, some people like Westerns because they feel a real connection to the land. And so those people might really think of the Western as being set. They might think about where they grew up, their childhood, were they growing up in Wyoming or Montana or on a farm or in Texas. So for them, the appeal might be a certain um, type of landscape or um, way of life that they have some connection to. So it's a nostalgia for a past time. Um, there's also sort of that, uh, again, um, that nostalgic instinct where there's clear-cut good guys and bad guys, you know, men were men and women were women. And, <laughs> You know, you didn't really have a lot of ambiguity or exploration of, um, you know, um, didn't really like question the boundaries as much. And so, you know, you've got books that appeal to uh, patrons who are looking for that type of material. I think once you get into more literary westerns, you get, you know, Deborah mentioned The Lone Hero, Alone in the Wilderness. Um, good guys, bad guys, I think sometimes in the literary westerns you get more of that sort of exploration, that existential angst or mm -hmm. the moral ambiguity, questioning those kinds of issues. 
And so those might appeal to people who aren't necessarily interested in Westerns per se, but are more interested in that sort of human condition. Uh -huh. uh, They're looking more for the character um, driven plot as opposed to action or, or you know, character driven stories right. as opposed to so plot or action. A Western that you might be able to uh, interest one of those types of readers in might not be the same type of, type of Western that you um, interest someone who has that more nostalgic um, mm -hmm. you know, viewpoint or that more, a little bit more conservative or you know, as far as crossovers, uh, some of the material that I read talked about you might even be able to interest people in what are considered gentle reads um, set in a Western setting. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's um, a sort of a nostalgic view of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know there are um, there are many. Uh, romances that take place in the West yeah. <laughs> and, and some some vendors are marking them as Western stories mm -hmm. well depending on your patron they might not really be interested in that romantic <laughs> twist <laughs> to the story they may be looking for something else but so did you is there anything else we um, wanted to talk about it here? Do you want to go to novels? Well, I think what we kind of wanted to do at this point before we started talking about specific books is jump to uh, Novelist, which is a resource that we now have statewide access to in Nebraska, um, and talk a little bit about how you can use a resource like that to familiarize yourself with a genre like Westerns. Um, how you can use that to connect your patrons to books that they might be interested in. And um, the first thing I wanted to show you in Novelist um, is uh, what they call a keeping up page for the Western genre. So I'm going to just jump to that page here. And this page brings together um, many lists and articles that uh, Novelist staff have compiled about the Westerns. And so if you are trying to uh, brush up on uh, your knowledge of Westerns. This is, this is a great place to start. It's also a great place to go if you're wanting to do some collection development or develop reading lists or book displays and you need some ideas. So um, you'll always get background information on the genre. Um, and you'll see they're going to talk about classic Westerns versus modern Westerns. Um, you've got reading lists that focus on particular archetypes um, in the genre, so outlaws and gunslingers, uh, western short stories, and then there's a really fun list that lists titles that they consider weird wild west stories, and so that actually um, sort of uh, blends with other genres like um, sometimes steampunk, there are some westerns that have zombies in them, etc. So you can really have a lot of fun with this genre in terms of bringing uh, bringing um, users that might not readers that might not normally like genre like Western genre is sort of into it. You can sort of there's sort of a some crossover potential here. Um, I do want to just pull up a couple of these articles so you can see the type of material that you can get in Novelist. Um, there are usually introductory uh, articles on specific genres, and so these answer the kinds of questions that Deborah and I started out talking mm -hmm. about. What are Westerns? What happens? Why do people like them? Um, they'll always give you um, some key titles, some key authors, um, and some tips on helping mm -hmm. uh, Western uh, fans. And this particular article does mention awards that are given specifically to Westerns. So uh, if you want to uh, look at those award lists, that's a way then to get some ideas for titles to either add to your collection or recommend to patrons. So um, finding awards that are genre specific is a useful way to get title ideas. Um, I also just want to show you um, a couple of these articles. Um, they will talk about specific types of Westerns, and the nice thing about these articles is they will always have uh, title suggestions within them. Mm -hmm. So again, every, um, every page you go to, you'll get more and more title suggestions. So um, you know, you can really, um, really uh, get ideas for collection development for 
uh, title list that you might want to hand out to your patrons. Uh, if you scroll down, uh, you'll have more title suggestions on this page. Um, you'll even have a handout uh, or a small poster that you can print out and put up to uh, give your readers some ideas of oh, titles nice. they might be interested in, so they've got those pre-made. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they're also on the main novelist page. Uh, you've got recommended reading lists over on the left. And by default, we're looking at adult fiction, uh, recommended reads lists, and you've got the Western category. So you have everything from classic Westerns uh, to the Weird Wild West that I talked about. So we'll just go ahead and pull up the Weird Wild West. Uh, these uh, are actually uh, reading lists that you can um, print out and hand out to your patrons. I'm trying to see, I think, I don't remember which one of these is the zombie one, but one of these is the actual zombie one. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, I'm going to change how this is displayed so we get uh, a little brief uh, description for each title. Uh, and then if you were wanting to print that out so you could hand it to patrons, have them look at it and share with you what they might be interested in, you can have a nice clean printout um, to hand out to patrons who are interested in maybe Westerns with a twist. Um, also, to the right, you'll always have additional um, links to articles and uh, title lists. And I believe... Uh, having trouble reading the text, it's small, but if I believe, if I'm remembering right, this particular article um, talks about Westerns written in the 50s and 60s, which is kind of considered the heyday. And they actually have um, book, a bookmark, uh, a pre-made bookmark that you can print out that has titles and descriptions for your patrons. So again, another way to get some ideas of uh, books to promote to your patrons and um, a handout that you can give them to take home. So uh, tools like Novelist are really helpful when you are working with the genres, particularly those you're not comfortable with. Um, I'm going to just do one search uh, before we get started talking about specific books. Um, in this particular database, uh, they do a lot with genre headings, and they have a genre heading that they they don't, I would say that there are some books in here that would be of interest to people who are interested in Westerns that there's a few that don't have this genre heading associated with it, but by and large, um, the, the sort of universal genre heading they use for Westerns is Western stories. And there are other ways to actually do this genre search, but I'm just typing in the field code GN capitalized, and then because my genre heading is more than one word, I do have to put quotation marks around it. So if I just do a search for genre Western stories, I get over 6,000 titles. Wow. And I think it's interesting, the first one that comes up is something that would probably be considered pretty atypical. It's Seth MacFarlane's A Million Ways to Die mm -hmm. in the West, which of course was a movie. Yeah. So that's going to be not something that's of interest to people who are fans of traditional Westerns, but right right away it sort of fit into that you, weird category, it, right? Because yeah, it's something... It shows you the, the, yeah. um, some of the uh, variability in the collection. What I really want to show you, though, is because uh, 6,000 titles is too many to go through, it's really nice you've got these uh, limit options over on the left, so I can pop this open, and you can see uh, other genres that are associated with the titles in this list. And so you can kind of look through these with your patron, or based on what your patron said about the material they like, you can look. Are they interested in literary fiction? Um, books to movies is a nice subcategory, because that, that might mm -hmm. help you with promoting um, promoting material or, or capitalizing on current interest. Um, I know right now in the theaters we've got Revenant and uh, the uh, Hateful Eight are in the theaters, and so you've got people who are going to be seeing those movies and you might be able to interest them in some similar mm -hmm. Western stories, mm -hmm. so that's a way to kind of drum up, drum up some readership. 
um, mystery stories. So there are, are books that are both westerns and mystery stories. So if your patron seems to be interested in that uh, problem solving, mystery solving aspect of uh, books, that would be a way to limit your search. Uh, you can also look at subject headings associated with westerns, and you've got everything from outlaws to ranch life to uh, ranchers, revenge, uh, small town life. So again, based on what they're really interested in, you can narrow that 6,000 plus uh, search to uh, something that meets their interests. So. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about that as a way to zero in on uh, people's areas of interest before uh, we turn it back to Deborah, and she's going to talk about some specific titles that she's read. And uh, let me get back there for you. Yeah. Okay. And we'll, before I talk about specific books, too, I just wanted to, I threw in a few slides here to show, you know, a, what variety there is. You know, a hero or any, actually any character in the story could be a cow puncher, a gunfighter, a mountain man, um, could be a lawman of some sort, a prospector. You know, there's just a variety. On the villain side, you'll notice that some of these headings are the same as the last one. You know, they can be good, good guys or bad guys. But here you also have, you know, your power-hungry men who are out to, you know, grab the land or or run off the sheep herders or, or whatever. Um, in addition to those type characters that your patrons might be looking for, um, you also have the women, okay? So if we're talking traditional Western, normally the women aren't the main characters. Um, but in, I found it amusing, <laughs> um, actually, how many of the books that were written within the last few years that I read um, one of the characters is an unfaithful wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, okay, were they really that way back then? Or um, is this modern uh, events, yeah. you know, being put into the past? But, you know, you had your, your character, your heroes who revered their mothers or had a sister who needed to be avenged or, you know, wound up with a mentally unstable daughter or wife that, you know, plot line went down that way. Um, the Pretty School Marm. One of the very first popular Western Westerns was uh, The Virginian, written by Owen Wister. And it's it started uh, a, the flood of Western books that were written. And he wrote about the cowboy and the pretty school marm. Well, that was a rather a romanticized view of the West, okay? So the very first book that I am going to talk about is called Log of a Cowboy, A Narrative of the Old Trail Days by Andy Adams. This book uh, um, has often been mistaken for a nonfiction work because he, he really was a, a cowboy and he did herd cattle from Texas up to Montana. Um, he had experience. Uh, in doing that, but for this book, he did actually fictionalize not only his experiences, but experiences that other cowboys told him about. Um, he wrote it in response to uh, the Virginian, but unfortunately, it is the only book he ever wrote. If someone is really interested in what was it really like at that time, what are some of the things that really happened when they were herding cattle? This is an excellent book. It's it's um, widely available in ebook format, and you can still buy a, a, a copy of it too, a, a paper copy of it also. Um, I found it really interesting um, that you'll find in all the different westerns, no matter when they were written, that they often the authors often try to. Uh, have the characters speak in the vernacular of that time. <laughs> and mm -hmm. some do a better job than others. Um, since this one was written in 1903 by a gentleman who actually, you know, uh, rode the range, um, I think his is a pretty accurate portrayal of how people actually spoke at that time, too. Um, and the for this particular book, the 
action takes place on the trail from Mexico, from the El, uh, El, uh, Rio Grande area um, in Texas. They're bring, they bring the herd of cattle across from Mexico and then drive it all the way to the Blackfoot Reservation up in northwest Montana because yeah. the, the, the boss um, has a government contract mm -hmm. to supply beef to the Indians. Mm -hmm. It'd be very interesting to compare that to the writing and like this is the vernacular of other stories who are obviously someone who did not actually experience it to right. see how you know, mm -hmm. how close yeah. they come. This is another um, story, The Flying U Ranch by B.M. Bauer, that was actually written uh, more contemporary mm -hmm. contemporaneous to the time. It was written in 1914. Uh, Mrs. Bauer actually is an, a woman, <laughs> um, she did write or publish using her initials because the publishers refused mm -hmm. to allow their uh, their buyers, the readers, to know that these books were written by a woman. Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid. Anyway. Scandalous. <laughs> yes. Bauer did actually live on a ranch in Montana uh, during the 1890s and uh, into the early 1900s, she, when the first, she wrote short stories to begin with and sold them to the popular magazines, and then she did get a contract with a publisher to write full-length stories. She did have um, a a cowboy who lived on the ranch uh, help her with her writing. He was also a writer. He was starting to write, and so. She helped him, and he helped her. He verified her facts, basically, on how uh, what life was really like for the cowboys. This book, in particular, is one of three that take place on the Flying U Ranch, which is in Montana. It's uh, I would call I call I thought folksy. <laughs> it was my first thought when I read this book. It is generally covers day to day life on a ranch. Okay. The plot is that sheep, uh, sheep ranchers moved in next door, bought up property, and it's a battle between, okay, do, you, do we let you run your sheep that tear up the land and muddy up our water into our water hole or not, okay? Um, in Novelist, I just wanted to point out, well, there are a couple things I wanted to point out, but one of the things I wanted to point out, um, Susan pulled a list for me for each of these books, and I thought folksy, they say it's uh, chaste. <laughs> and I found okay. that, yeah, I, I found that sort of amusing, but I have to say, um, Mrs. Bauer says that the cowboys curse, but she doesn't say the actual words that they ah. use, <laughs> so I guess you she could call it that chaste. Far, yeah. yes. Yes. <laughs> dialect filled, but with some limitations. Right, right. Yes. Because writing is so. a dialect, so. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. She definitely does. So again, mm -hmm. if you really, if you want to have a good, sort of an uh, overview of what ranch life was like, <clears throat> and written by a person who actually lived on a ranch back mm -hmm. in the 1890s, early 1900s, um, mm -hmm. and isn't looking for uh, a lot of action, actually. This is a really good book. Okay, we're going to go back to the oh, right. yep, yep. It is here. Okay, next. Oh, and I also wanted to say um, for this particular book, the University of Nebraska Press has reprinted it, but it is also available through um, as as an ebook mm -hmm. from several different publishers. Mm -hmm. So, okay. The next one that I want to talk about, and I, I'm sort of stuck on Montana writers because I know them a little bit better because I lived in Montana for a while. Um, and Dorothy M. Johnson wrote some really classic stories that were made into movies. Um, the main one being The Man Who Shot, and I'll say it the Hollywood way, Liberty Balance. I actually heard her on uh, the Missoula radio station in the University of Montana radio station before she died back in the 80s and she said well they never asked me but that's not how you pronounce his last name uh -huh. <laughs> so they wrote this song and made this movie and and said liberty balance but no it was liberty balance oh. 
<laughs> so, Somebody should remake it Hollywood. correctly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Johnson's works were more gritty, um, and actually, the man who shot Liberty Valance um, softened the story by quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, if you want, if you have someone who wants uh, a bit more gritty, um, good versus evil. Um, somebody, a man who who really regrets uh, something he did and feels guilty for the rest of his life, you know that type of a story. Um, I would suggest her her works. There are actually three of these are actually short stories, and one is um, a novella, and mm -hmm. it is available in this uh, combined uh, format now for purchase. So so. That's another type of story that your patrons might be looking for. Okay. If you remember Mrs. Bauer, she was really popular back in the, the 19, uh, early 1900s. And many r Western writers actually were very influenced by her work, um, including T.B. Olson, who was actually Theodore. This is not another. Uh, uh, Initials hiding a woman um, and I had read that he was really influenced by her and then I read this book that he wrote called Kino and I was sort of surprised because while I call um, the Flying U Ranch folksy this is very definitely gritty mm -hmm. and um, you, you have a main character who has had a very hard life the man who raised him since he was two years old beat him regularly until Kino got old enough and big enough to fight back. But uh, he's been caught. He's gotten a message from his foster father to come meet him at, in sort of a desert, remote area to um, run a con with some other guys. They are actually going to planning on stealing money from a cattle rancher, a powerful man in the area, who is actually stealing money from the government and the Indians because he's mining uh, he, gold on reservation property. Okay, But Kino still has a sense of right and wrong, and um, he fights back. He fights injustice, I guess you would say. But it's just a very gritty life, okay? Mm -hmm. I found it, so comparing it to the Bauer book, I found it really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let me see what I, okay. So moving, oops, I hit it one too many times. Mm -hmm. Moving on, okay. Louis and the Moor, very, 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 very popular. Mm -hmm. So I debated about whether talking about him, but you know, he remains popular. And a lot of current writers use the same basic themes and settings that Louis and the Moor does. He did tend to write sort of what I would call family sagas. Um, he had his Sackett series, for example, where he followed the fa had a story about the father and then a number of the sons and then other things happened, etc. The one that I picked to talk about today called Sackett is about one of the sons named William Tell Sackett, or Tell for short. Okay, um, he, is a, he has been a roamer. Um, he's up work, at the beginning of the story, he was working uh, as a cow puncher, and um, he's ready to move on. His brothers have married and settled down, and he's thinking about that, too. He's been wandering around the West for a while now, and he's sort of thinking about um, finding somebody, a woman, to, a good woman to marry and settling down on a ranch and having kids himself. But on his way uh, to, from Montana, or up north, to uh, his brother's place down in Colorado, he happens to come across a gold mine. You know, there's lots of prospecting in some of these books. And some of the themes in this book are greed, of course. Um, and I would say family loyalty. 
but also in the, this is one where the main character is very independent and self-sufficient. At one point, he gets caught um, in a cave, you know, out out in a in an uninhabited uh, valley, and there's a really big ice storm and then a snowstorm on top of it. And he needs he doesn't have enough food to last out the winter if he does get caught here, and his um, horses, mules are are sort of stuck. He can't get food to them, so he actually makes himself snowshoes so that he can <laughs> move around. You know, so very self-sufficient. Um, it's very respectful of women, and uh, it's very quick read. Okay, and I think that's one thing that might appeal to traditional Western readers. Um, the, the books often tend to be fairly short, and if you're listening to the audio version, which I did several for several of these titles, um, they take less than five hours generally, mm -hmm. somewhere between four and a half and five hours. Oops, and before I go there, I'm sorry, I was going to go to the, show you the novelist page just to um, show you that if you are looking for, if somebody does want a Louis L'Amour type book, okay, in novelist you do have the read-alikes, James Michener is another one that I think of as writing sort of what sagas. But wouldn't be short. But wouldn't be no. short. <laughs> no. <laughs> you understand what they like about the yeah. Louis L'Amour. Yeah. yeah. Uh, El Elton, uh, gosh, I, Elmer oh. Kelton, I have a hard time with his name, is another one who's fairly popular but wrote some years ago um, and is uh, sort of the loner out on his own. Uh, William Johnstone, whom I'll talk about at one of his you books. You hover over those, it'll actually oh, tell sorry. you. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, let me just hover here a second. It will yeah. actually tell you uh, what what the similarities are. Um, for example, plot-driven, um, Western stories, outlaws. So you can kind of get a sense, is it is this, is the overlap in the area that is, is interesting? But, Patron. Right, yeah. And of course, Tell has to battle outlaws who want to take his gold, the, yeah, that he found. So, so yeah, we have a variety of read likes down here. But if they do want, you know, if they wanted the family sagas, you can specify which parts they liked about this book and then do another search too. So, yeah, there's some that the gunfights aren't actually you know stand on the street and shoot them out gunslinger <laughs> type thing, but there's there are some fights, yeah. So, so that's that. Louis L'Amour. Okay, so then we go on to William Johnstone, and I decided to go ahead and talk about uh, Johnstone because um, I think he is his writing is very similar to Louis L'Amour, and he is still writing. Even though he is getting up there in years, he is oh. still writing. Um, and he sometimes writes with his nephew, J.A. Johnstone. He also uh, follows um, what he calls a family, the Jensen family. They're actually three men that have sort of formed their own family. They're not biologically related. But this particular book, The Hard Ride to Hell, um, is longer uh, than a Louis L'Amour book, but that's because, and I, and I have to admit, I didn't go back and look through other uh, Family Jensen books just to see if he, if he follows the same format, but in this one, he, follow, he gives each of the three men a story mm -hmm. before they then come together to solve the big final problem, so it turns into a bit of a longer book. In this particular one, um, Preacher uh, has vis is visiting an Indian chief that he knows, and the uh, the encamp Indian encampment is raided, and the chief's daughter and grandson are kidnapped. So he sends for Matt and Smoke, the two boys, to come and help him. Well, Matt 
or sorry, smoke is uh, dealing with rustlers. So he has that to solve before he can head off to help preacher. And Matt is uh, helping um, uh, the station agent uh, at another place to deal with some stagecoach robbers. <laughs> so you have always, multiple different, <laughs> yeah, there's always something going on. <laughs> but again, um, you've got the, the, the men who roam, which basically a uh, preacher is a mountain man. That's how he describes himself. That's how he's described in the book. Um, Matt roams around doing, you know, jobs here and there and someplace else. He'll, you know, work as a, as a cow puncher and sometimes, you know, he'll do something like help <laughs> stop stage robbers. Smoke has settled down. He um, married a school teacher <laughs> and has his own ranch, you know. So, so there's a bit of a variety there. There is action uh, in this story, um, and I, so I think people would, would enjoy that one. Okay, for something just a little bit different, um, Blue-Eyed Devil by Robert B. Parker. Unfortunately, Parker has died, but the series is being continued by Robert Knott. In this one, there are two men. So you, in, I don't know that you say necessarily that one is the main character and the other one's a sidekick, um, although one tends to speak for the other because one's sort of, doesn't talk a lot. <laughs> um, Virgil Cole and Everett Hitch. Uh, sometimes in some books they're lawmen, and in sometimes they're uh, pseudo lawmen. They're they're fighting for the right thing when the local sheriff or whatever is not doing his job. Okay, so they switch back and forth. But when I read this one which is, was written by Robert B. Parker, um, what really struck me was the dry humor in it. If you ever saw the movie Silverado, mm -hmm. okay, it reminded me of that one. A lot of uh, stuff is sort of yeah. tongue-in-cheek, you know? Um, but it, it's humorous. Um, most of the, usually the action takes place in, in a town where they're trying to solve uh, some kind of problem whether you've got people who are taking advantage of other people or people who are trying to steal from other people or uh, whatever's going on, okay? So it's, a, again, a very quick read. Um, I did look at one of the, the books that was written by Robert Knott, and while the characters are still there, they're still doing the same types of things, and there wasn't quite as much of the same humor. So that changes a little bit, but they're still off having adventures. Okay. Okay. And I think, sorry, <laughs> I'm looking at my notes here, I was going to go to the novelist. I lost my pointer there for a second. Here we go. Okay, on this particular one, they point to different books for read-alikes, variety. Um, it is very fast-paced. This one they say gritty, and I, I get I would agree with that to an extent. It's not as gritty as Kino, but it it's more they're more, uh, they're hard men, basically, okay? And, yeah, it's witty. <laughs> they say things that are humorous. And, yep, this one had the police misconduct. So, <clears throat> moving on. And if anyone has any titles or authors that they want to contribute as being similar or being... Um, that people might like for the same style, please feel mm -hmm. free to send them in too, okay? And I will get this right here mm -hmm. sooner or later. 
one at a time. The next title that I was going to talk about is Tenbo by Matt Brown. We're back with the, um, the law type character, but in this particular case, the main character is a private investigator. He did at one time, um, he worked very briefly for the U.S. Marshals, and he also worked as a detective for um, different banks and railroads. But at the time, at this time, he is um, working on his own as a private investigator, and he's been hired to find out who is killing ranchers in the Tenbo Valley of Wyoming. Um, he does work as a track as a tracker. He's trying to, um, he goes to the places where the shootings have occurred and he finds where the, the uh, sniper basically, because there's, it, the killer is shooting over a very long distance, where the sniper actually uh, was to, while he, where he waited and then where he uh, shot the person. And he tracks, tracks, he, you know, he follows the forensic evidence, I guess you would say. Um, so I, I found it interesting. The, he you know, took on different characters at one point. He took on the character of a gambler, and then he uh, worked, went out to a ranch and, and posed as a horse breaker. And you know, just he could fit into a variety of different um, fields. Um, he could do different things while he was trying to gather this information. And he does solve at the end, you know, who the um, who the perpetrator was. And this is, an, is one of those books where the wife uh, was unfaithful to the husband. That's part of the main plot line. <laughs> um, I guess that's mostly what I was going to say about this one. Okay. Rough Justice. <clears throat> By Lyle Brandt. This was written within the past couple of years. That this is actually number two in the Gideon Ryder series. Gideon Ryder um, is a, has been hired by the Secret Service. Again, he was a U.S. Marshal, but because of a scandal, he got kicked out. This takes place just after the Civil War, and the Secret Service was had um, as in relation to the stories, has just been established. Gideon is out in Texas, and he is has been assigned different jobs, think problems that are going on that need to be solved. In the first book, <clears throat> excuse me, he um, handles uh, pirates and smugglers. In this particular book, Rough Justice, he is trying to find out what he can about the um, KRS, the Knights of the Rising Sun. Hmm. Think Ku Klux Klan, basically. Uh -huh. um, there is a contingent in Texas that doesn't want to accept that they lost, the South lost the Civil War, that the, that the um, African Americans are now um, not allowed to be held in slavery, they go after people who um, are trying to set up schools and help the freedmen in Texas. And Gideon is trying to find out who's the head of the organization in Texas and whether um, they are actually trying to raise up, uh, get uh, put in motion a rebellion and set in motion another war, basically. So, so he has to handle those guys. The next one <clears throat> is Black Justice, Justice by Jason Elder. This is part of the Outcast series, and again, it's number two. This one's a little bit different in that um, there is a group of men that is traveling together towards California, and along the way, they keep running into incidents where they help out, okay? Um, and it's they're, call, it's they're called the outcasts because for one reason or another, they can't go back home and uh, 
other people don't really want, want them around. Okay. Um, so in this particular one, they've stopped in a town for a couple days, you know, to eat and replenish and uh, their supplies, etc. But they run into trouble. One of them is actually bitten by a snake, <laughs> a rattlesnake. Um, as he's trying to get away from the sheriff because he um, cuckolded the sheriff. <laughs> So that's why that guy doesn't like him. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So he's hiding out, and in the in in the process of hiding out, he sees a murder occur, for which a black man is um, arrested and tried and going to be hung. Okay. But he the he doesn't want to go to the sheriff and say. Hey, I saw this murder occur, and I know that it wasn't done by this particular man. So the others in the group um, try to figure out who actually did murder the guy. And so it is a mystery. It, several of these, you'll notice, are do have very much a mystery theme. Something occurs, and they try. Someone is trying to figure out who did it, why did it happen, etc. So that's another uh, book that has certain themes to it. Let it bleed. Um, I put this one in. I was trying to do something of a variety. This is part of a series, Gunsmith. Uh, his nickname is Gunsmith. His real name is Clint Adams. There are a number of books written about that J.R. Roberts has written about him. And in each one, he has a different adventure. This particular series is a bit more um, graphic in its um, description of the interactions between men and women. <laughs> uh, it's shows bumbling police and power-hungry politicians. Um, but as a twist, there's a journalist from Boston who's been following a serial killer across the country. Oh. And now um, the serial killer is in Abilene. So the journalist has talked the gunsmith into partnering with him to try to track down this man who's been killing women. Um, everywhere he goes. Um, I When I read this, I what I thought of in comparison is a, a, a TV series. Hmm. Okay. Each, I see, it does have the subtitle on the cover, the all-action Western series. Yeah, so in well, kinda... in this particular one wasn't quite so much action, but it moved, the story moved along really fast because every chapter was only about two and a half pages long. So wow. you jump from scene okay. to scene to scene to scene, just like in a TV, yeah. you know, an episode of a TV series. So hmm. what does the 397 mean? Is that how many there are in this series? No. <laughs> That's how many he has written, but I could not find that there are actually 397 of, that are particularly focused on the gunsmith. Uh, so, yeah, I, that one, that was a little strange. <laughs> the other thing about this cover is none of the illustrations really portray exactly what happened in the story. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't go by the cover necessarily. It's a little license so. with their uh, advertising there. <laughs> right, right. So, so far I've talked about mainly what are considered sort of traditional stories. They take place um, in the late 1800s. There's, uh, there usually is some kind of action, you know, good trying to overcome evil. Um, some are gritty, some aren't, but they are more um, fictionalized characters. Okay. So someone did actually comment and say Gunsmith is very popular at her library. Yeah. So Yeah, I imagine so. <laughs> um, whoops. On the other, on the other side of what I've been talking about are the more literary and what some people can uh, 
have defined, what the Western writers of America have defined as historical Westerns, okay? Where in this particular uh, title, The Last Kind Words Saloon, Larry McMurtry um, does a fictionalized version of, sorry, I just lost the, <laughs> the words that I wanted, the um, da, Wyatt Earp and uh, Doc Holliday and the shootout at the last corral is at the very end, okay? Charles Goodnight, a famous uh, cowboy down in Texas is in there. They, um, they bring in um, uh, an, an English peer who plans on building this you know, big castle down in the Southwest, which actually happens sometimes. So in your historical Westerns, you have actual people who lived, historical real people, historical real events, um, and things of that nature, okay? Larry McMurtry also um, writes at a different uh, literary level, I guess you would say. Um, but on the other hand, as Susan mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes you've got those books where it's, more, you're, they're looking at the internal, sometimes internal angst of, you know, which way do you go and on a particular issue, and um, it's more character driven. Um, there was action in this story, however, there is very, it's very gritty. Many of the characters are very dysfunctional. There's wife abuse. There's very graphic descriptions of torture by Indians. Um, he doesn't totally stick to the facts. <laughs> uh, as, you know, he, he, he imagines, license. yes, he takes literary license. He imagines what has happened, you know, uh, between these characters before this shootout occurs. Um, so, you know, some people really like that type of thing and others prefer not to. Um, and I'm going to pop the novelist here for just a second, if I can get my pointer in the right way. There we go. Okay. Yep. Oh, and Buffalo Bill's Wild West show is involved in this story too, hmm. storyline. So, um, say it's action-packed, engaging, gritty. Um, characters are exaggerated, definitely. Um, hmm. There's abusive men, there's alcoholics, you've got the British in the United States, you know, you're different people, it's ranchers, hmm. and all those types of things. So you've got both you have a wide range to pick from. So we go back to the reader's advisory. We keep, you know, we keep cycling back to that. What exactly are your patrons looking for? What is the appeal for in the books that they really like? Okay. Um, just to wrap up, I did want to point out some of the um, Western writers who've recently won awards. Historic novels. Um, we've got authors that I did not talk about, um, mm -hmm. but they've written books recently that have been award worthy. Um, you have contemporary. When when we're talking contemporary, that just means post 1940. The story takes place post 1940, where these others take place before 1940. Okay, so those are some authors that have won awards. And then we just wanted to talk for a minute about some mm. other authors that maybe are writing um, contemporary books that take place in the contemporary time, but have Western settings and themes that are, are like the traditional Westerns. So, of course, Craig Johnson, who writes about um, Walt Longmire, who's a sheriff in Wyoming, uh, C.J. Box, who's um, also... Uh, what's his name? Joe Pickett, uh, who's I just lost it. Is he, he's a game warden 
in Wyoming. J.A. Jantz writes several different series um, that take that follow law people in the West, mm -hmm. and of course Tony Hillerman's classic mm -hmm. uh, Joe Lee Porn and Jim Chi books. Some other authors that you might not have heard of, Patrick McManus writes um, about Sheriff Bo Tully, and his is more tongue-in-cheek, weird, uh -huh. wacky characters again. Um, Keith McCafferty writes um, about, um, oops. Ah, he writes uh, the Sean Stranahan mystery series, um, in, which take place in Montana. Uh, Stranahan is an XPI, and he's now a fishing guide, but he keeps getting involved in mysteries. But there's a lot of outdoors in it, and you know Western themes. Michael McGarity has actually written both a um, contemporary uh, modern series. And he's then went on to write a historical series. In the contemporary series, his main character is Kevin Kearney. And he works, he's in New Mexico. And over the series of 12 titles, he wor has worked for the State Patrol. He's been a sheriff, a police chief. You know, he keeps moving around from one agency to another. Um, but he does pull in a lot of historical information and you know works with the Native Americans in the area and that type of thing. His historical series actually follow um, Kevin Kearney's ancestors who moved to New Mexico. So um, John Talton writes a series about David Mapstone who is a former county sheriff in Arizona. Peter Bowen writes um, a Gabriel Dupree series, which is, again, takes place in Montana. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's a cattle brand inspector and sometimes a sheriff's deputy. So there, there are many out there. You can, in um, uh, novelist, as Susan showed you, narrow down to the genre term of Western stories and add a state in if you're if people are looking for a particular state. They want to read something about their home state. Yeah. Right. Right. So and I found that um, a lot of the books I did talk about all of the books I read, but a lot of them um, that are traditional take place in Colorado. A lot mm -hmm. based there too. So um, so go on to the last one. And I just put this uh, slide together just sort of for the fun of it. Um, since I started working with novelists in July, as I go along and I'm looking for materials, I'm always taken by just the large number of terms that they have mm -hmm. compiled to describe books to help uh, librarians and readers identify what it is about books that appeal to them. And so when I'm working on a project like this, when I'm looking at information about Westerns, as I go along, I just, as a matter of course, kind of keep a running tab of uh, terms that they use. Um, so genre terms that are associated with many of the mystery stories, uh, locations, appeal terms, subject headings. And the nice thing about these is that um, you know, with a little background information on how to do searching in Novelist, you can kind of start mixing and match, matching these on behalf of your patrons. So um, Western stories, like uh, I've said, and like Deborah's, Deborah has said, that's sort of the overarching, the most uh, likely uh, genre term to use to get the most uh, titles. But you've got, uh, you can mix and match it with other genres, for instance. Um, and I'll just point out, I do have a little screenshot of the keyword search screen in Novelist. And the way you would do a search and target these terms is you've got the field label, which is a two-character uh, capitalized uh, label. And I've got the uh, those codes behind each uh, category. So genre is capital G, capital N. Location is capital S, capital D. 
Um, so I can put down genre, and then adventure stories is a term that's used, and because it's more than one word, I do have to put it in quotation marks, then the capital and, and then I just plugged in the location, SD the West is another terminology term that they use. So if what your patron really, really likes is the adventure aspect of uh, Westerns and um, the setting of the West, um, you can try some searches like that and maybe identify titles that um, get lost in the shuffle if you've just done, you know, if you've pulled up all 6,000 Western stories. Yes. Um, or, like we were saying, you can put SD and then your state name if, you, if the patron really wants to read about things in a particular state. Um, I really had to, um, I had a lot more subject terms written down than would fit on here, so this is just, <laughs> so just, many, an, yeah. uh, just to a give sampling. you an idea of, mm -hmm. you know, specific sort of character archetypes that are in these books. If, if you know, somebody, you know, for example, if somebody's seen Revenant and wants um, mm -hmm. other books that are kind of about mountain men, um, mountain men is a subject term that you can use. So, um, you know, it, it takes a little playing around with the database to get to the point where you can really use these um, tools, but it gives you a lot of power in terms mm -hmm. of pulling oh, up yeah. material. So mm -hmm. I just kind of wanted to give you a sense of how, how much you have at your disposal when you, when you have a, a resource like Novelist available to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you guys want to show, you had brought up um, previously the, um, the Western Writers of America page. It's, you have to close some of these probably. There it is. There you go. Yes. Um, you can go into, um, if you want to, you can go, if you go into the, about the awards, you'll actually pull up a PDF document that gives a, a description for each of the different types of awards that they give, and then I'll just pop down to winners. And they list all of them all the way back to 1953. 53, yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, the categories that they give awards in have changed over the years, but this last year, as we said, they do um, give an award to a contemporary novel, which is the post-1940. The historical is actually, um, pre-1940, but has a historical person, place, or you know, event in it. And then the traditional novel is pre-1940, but is not, um, does not include historical people or events. Okay. And then they have, they go on to others, you know, they do talk about juvenile, um, which we have not talked about here today, but there are, you know, kids who like to read westerns okay. and lots of authors to choose from there. Um, they do give to the first novel, and they do nonfiction uh, awards also, biographies, and that type of thing. So this is another source to find ideas of authors and titles. The other thing that I think is interesting here, um, you know, if you're doing reader's advisory in a particular genre, and you'll often find associations and organizations out there that promote that genre and so their websites are really great resources for you as the librarian and maybe for patrons who are real big fans of that genre mm -hmm. they they might be interested in following that um, mm -hmm. association as well many of these associations now are available in this case you'll notice along the left um, it's, they're available on Facebook and Twitter um, there's apps that you can download, so again, depending on how plugged in nice. your patron is to, to social media, you might be able to get mm -hmm. them hooked up with some of these resources so they can mm -hmm. Find some do some of that research themselves mm -hmm. and, and discover new authors. Right, and uh, and uh, we know you can't buy everything, <laughs> and you yes. might have some patrons who are, you know, who read a great deal and are always in asking for more, more, more. Mm -hmm. um, there's always in their library loan. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but also, um, a lot of Western books, not all of the, these um, authors, unfortunately, but a lot of them are available through uh, vendors like Overdrive. And mm -hmm. for those libraries um, 
who are part of the Nebraska Overdrive group, we do try to buy a variety of Western titles mm -hmm. to put into the collection too. And not everybody wants the um, print version. A lot of patrons do want the audio version also. Oh, right. and so um, we do put those into Overdrive also. And there's always um, use online used booksellers. And right. I know a lot of people who are constantly buying used books through Amazon for you know mm -hmm. pennies on the you know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. For a lot of these that are written back that you could I mean a lot of your titles you mentioned ever work really old ones and they're gonna probably not gonna you're not gonna find them through your your current <laughs> right. Um, Unless they've been reprinted. Right. Some of right. the classics right. are yes. reprinted often, but yeah. others, yeah. And they might be paperbacks, and they might mm -hmm. not be in the best condition, but that means mm -hmm. they might be cheap. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, they might, you might get yeah. them for a couple of bucks, and so. One of them that I checked out from our local library That's here in Lincoln. That's an old edition. You can tell by looking yeah, at it. It's yeah, it's 1970, and it's been rebound. <laughs> <laughs> because I guess they decided it was a classic, and they wanted to keep it, you know. Enough so, people were checking out the previous version out. before it got the new cover, yeah. 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 So. so, and despite what Harper Collins thinks, I bet you can check them out more than 26 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, were there any questions, any comments? Um, no, know, except for the one about oh. the um, okay. gunsmith being very popular at oh, someone's library. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions or comments about anything? I know. Before we do wrap up. Just realize we just Yeah, we're a little over. over time. That's okay. <laughs> Is everybody still stuck around till the end here? So, oh, okay. Well, if you have any suggestions, especially, and I'll say, especially those libraries in Nebraska, if you have suggestions for authors or titles, you know, things that your patrons are looking for that aren't currently um, in our shared Overdrive collection, mm -hmm. please do feel free Let to send know. in suggestions, and we'll see if we can um, add those titles to the collection. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that are watching too, um, you noticed in the slides there were the links to the the novelist for some of the titles. Um, if you're well in Nebraska or anywhere you have novelists, that will work. And we put up the the, um, the slides we posted, so you have access to that um, along with the recording afterwards. You'll be able to see um, where all those where you might be able to get more information about all those books. Um, and if you don't have novelists, I don't know, if, see what you guys have in your states <laughs> that you can do something similar with. Sure, books in print and um, other. Oh, good reads. Uh, yeah, or oh, good yeah. reads mm -hmm. library thing. You, they might the not. Yeah, they might. They might not. They won't put in all you know the appeals and things like that. But you can definitely search for Western stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, someone did just say, we've got Western readers, so thanks for all the suggestions. Oh, yes, okay. so they definitely learned some new ones, probably, that they hadn't you know, done before. All right, well, it doesn't look like any other urgent questions have come in, but so that's great. But um, thank you very much, Deborah and Susan. Like As we said, this is a um, infrequent series, we'll call it, <laughs> of uh, Library Commission staff sharing books that they've read or um, genres. And there'll be more coming up. As I said, we don't have an actual exact schedule of when, but when every few months we come up with it takes an some time idea. To like get up to speed on some of these genres. It does if you haven't read them. Yeah. Previously, I think we've done really good where we've found people on staff who read the certain area, a certain genre, right. a certain type of book, and have gathered them together. But um, this is not always going to happen like this one. This was a, I, brand new to both of you guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we learned a lot about it. Mm -hmm. So. Cool. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Deborah and Susan, for sharing all that information with us. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, the show has been recorded, as usual, and it will be here on our Encompass Live website, over here where we have our archived Encompass Live sessions, right beneath all our upcoming ones. It will be posted here with the um, recording, the slides, and um, links to well, yes, we have Novelist and Western Writers of America webpage. We'll have those links up there for you as well. Um, later today, I'll say, if I'm feeling ambitious, i got to wait for everything to process and get everything posted and uploaded, but we'll get up there and you'll all get emails when it's ready to, um, to view. Um, so I hope that'll wrap it up for today. I'll help you join us next week when, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are gradually moving the Library Commission to Windows 10. Some of our computers, like the one we're using today, 
is in Windows 10. The computer in my office is not yet, so I'm bouncing back and forth, and I know lots of other people are doing the same thing. Um, but next week, we'll have our topic will be moving to Windows 10. Holly Wolt, who is one of our IT people here um, at the Library Commission, is going to come and tell us um, what's going on with it, uh, overview of it, and how you can use it at your library if you do need to move to Windows 10. So just to get an idea about what the heck is going on with this wonderful new version of Windows that some of us may have to use at some point. Um, and also sign up for any of our other topics. We've got our upcoming shows there. We've got more coming into the schedule. Um, they'll be posted as I get the full information from all of our presenters. So keep an eye on our schedule there. Also, if you are a big Facebook user and Compass Live is on Facebook, if you go over there and like our page, you'll get notifications of our shows here. As you see this morning, I posted a reminder to log in um, for our show. Um, you can log in on the fly if you don't pre-register. Um, and when our recordings are available, I post up here. So um, if you are big on uh, Facebook, definitely um, give us a like over there. Other than that, that wraps it up for today. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll see you next week.